So if anybody doesn't know Karen Frazier, she was uh, the, she's a former senator, state senator at the 22nd district, and she served as senator for 24 years and had many leadership positions there in the Senate. And before that, she served in the legislature uh, for four years as a state rep and also a local, she was an elected uh, official for 15 years. She um, became the first woman mayor of Lacey, the second woman Thurston County Commissioner, and the first woman president of the Washington State Association of Counties. She has many honors and recognitions, too many for me to, to uh, tell you about. Um, her latest was the, the Japanese Foreign Minister's Commendation in 2014, all the way back to the finalist in the Thurston County Citizen of the Year, twice Legislator of the Year. Um, also, what I like, I love this title, she was named our fearless leader, <laughs> justice seeker, faithful to the Democratic Vision Award. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. <laughs> I love that in 20, 2004. <laughs> um, and she has also summited four of Washington's major peaks, hiked and backpacked throughout the Olympics and Cascades, and won numerous awards for racing her own sailboat in Puget Sound races and completed this, the Capital City Marathon twice. Ooh. So please welcome. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm just getting over a thing here. Don't ever fly with a cold. <laughs> so, uh, oh, someone was sick too there. This is the PowerPoint screen, right? No, no, no. Oh, it's this one. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm so impressed with your uh, very active level of involvement. You're doing good for democracy, and so thank you. Um, so I was asked to kind of do a presentation that I did at the Olympia Senior Center a few months ago. And it's on the, the topic is what the legislature cannot do. You know, usually when you hear a talk about the legislative process, well, we do this. And here's how a bill becomes a law and so forth. But um, let's see if I can figure this out. There, well, there's our beautiful Capitol building. Can you see this? I'll stay out of the way. Uh, but so here is a very famous. Uh, saying that you probably hear throughout the country. Uh, no person's life, liberty, or property are safe while the legislature is in session. <laughs> and uh, you know, I actually take great exception to that, and that's how I've organized this talk. Why you're probably safer than you might think, and sometimes you're too safe. So. So is this quote accurate? I'd say absolutely not. And there are uh, three main reasons. First is the political context in which the legislature operates. It is not an island unto itself. It, it interacts and is influenced by and is subject to authorities of federal, state, local, tribal governments and so forth. So there's the political context including the US Constitution and the state constitution. Another reason that the, uh, you're safe is the complexity of the legislative process. It's very complex and it's hard to get anything through. So, um, we noticed. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it cuts both ways. Yeah. So, uh, so I, what I tell people is that if somebody introduces a bill that kind of freaks you out, you don't like it, kind of like, don't worry. There's only about an 18% chance it'll pass. <laughs> and chances are, if it's controversial, it'll be amended. Mm -hmm. That's one really good thing about the legislative process, opportunity for amendment, which you can't really do with initiatives. And then the third reason is political accountability of legislators to their constituents. And uh, legislators, 
you know, they're elected by district and uh, they're always tuned in to, well, what do people think? Because I want to do a good job and also I might want to get reelected so I can't get too sideways with the people in my district. So they're very influenced by who contacts them and what they size up as the uh, opinion, you know, opinions on various issues in the district. So these, uh, these, these are major kind of reasons why uh, you're, you're maybe safer than you think you are in this, this phrase, nothing's safe, life, liberty, or property, is absolutely not true. But, but if you think you need something, that's, it's very hard to get through, and you're pretty well aware of that. So, so, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those reasons. So, the political legal context. Uh, the legislature, uh, oops, <laughs> something's installing. Anyway, the, oh, it's on here too. The, first of all, the, the U.S. Constitution, we have a dual constitutional system in this country. Most countries don't have that. So the U.S. Constitution and the state constitution both affect how, uh, uh, affect the legislature. And I'll go into a little more of that. And then uh, tribal treaties affect what the legislature can't do. Uh, there's a state enabling act. Most people haven't heard of it, but it's really important. Uh, before a territory, we, we used to be the Washington Territory, before a territory can become a state, Congress passes an enabling act to enable the territory to become a state. And in there is a to-do list. You, in order to become a state, you have to have the voters approve a constitution that provides for this kind of long list of things. And uh, so those things remain in effect. So for example, in our state, uh, uh, well, you have to, we had to have a, you know, a statewide education system. We have to use monies from lands the federal government gave us at statehood for various purposes. And we have to have a Republican form of government, meaning representational and so forth. So there are a lot of things in the State Enabling Act. Then the Washington State Constitution uh, provides a lot of context for the legislature has a lot of detail in it about a lot of policies, particularly property tax and a lot of things. It defines a structure of state government and it has a lot of very important protections for the citizen as the legislative process goes on and I think I have a slide on that. And then again, the political process of legislators' accountability to their constituents, that's always on their mind. So. So, what well, will be done with this in a minute? So here's a question. <coughs> so we have basically four categories of government. Most people aren't used to thinking about that. Federal, state, local, tribal. And so try, if you had a piece of paper, I might ask you in a class, I would ask you, well, take a minute, and how would you draw the lines, an org chart between those four? What are the lines of authority between federal, tribal, state, local. Think about it. <coughs> Try to think what you would think about that. So here are some <laughs> diagrams that I have discerned that others have in their head. <laughs> One, it's just a mishmash of boxes and lines and arrows. <laughs> others just think it's a big fog relationship between all these governments. Uh, there is a movement not so much in this state, but parts of the Southwest, I think counties have authority over the federal government, <laughs> which is nonsense. And then some people are just blank. You know. <laughs> so now I'll show you my diagram. So my diagram starts with this. The federal government is, we well, maybe I really ought to call it a national government, but the federal government is the supreme law of the land. And it is what it, how it's organized, and the powers it has are those that have been delegated to it by the people through the words in the U.S. Constitution. So the federal government can't just do anything. You have to find something in the U.S. Constitution about it. 
and granted it's very, very broad, and of course there's vast U.S. Supreme Court decisions on this. And then, so then each state has its own state constitution. So the states have quite a bit of independence from the national government, but there's also kind of an overlap in terms of what each can do. And this overlap can grow or shrink depending on mainly what Congress does or how the U.S. Supreme Court interprets the federal constitution. So then here's how I build in the others. Um, well, this one doesn't have local government on it. See, does the next one? Yeah, it does. Okay. So, uh, tribal treaties uh, are with the uh, federal government. They are not with the state governments. So, notice there's no line there between state government and tribal treaties. So, the state government cannot tell tribes what to do. Lots of people think you can or want to do it. There's vast negotiation, you know, and cooperation between tribes and state and local government, but uh, there's no authority with just maybe a few exceptions. So, and international treaties are kind of the same thing. And when Congress ratifies an international treaty, it has the same authority as, as a provision of the U.S. Constitution. So one of the biggest international treaties affecting the state of Washington is the Columbia River Treaty. So, and then occasionally we have interstate compacts. So like, for example, there's one down for the scenic area in the Columbia Gorge. So, so here we have federal, state, and tribal with international treaties occasionally affecting us. And uh, so here I've built in the local governments so local governments are strictly a creature of the states. They, uh, they, there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution about local governments. So everything they do is authorized either through the state constitution or action of the legislature. So this includes counties, cities, school districts, port districts, fire districts, library districts, and many, many other special purpose districts. I think you have a hospital district here in Mason County. So, so the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. So uh, the things that it does that limit legislatures, various constitutional provisions, some of them say states you must do this, you can't do that. Uh, we have laws that li implement the U.S. Constitution, tribal treaties, international treaties, Supreme Court decisions, interstate compacts, and so forth. So. It's, so the legislature can't just do whatever it wants. It has to always be thinking about all of this. So as I mentioned, the U.S. Constitution has delegated powers. It can't just do whatever it wants. And so occasionally there's a Supreme Court decision that says an act of Congress is unconstitutional because that is not, there was one on, I think, zones around schools where you can't have guns some years ago. And I think if the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that violated, there was nothing in the U.S. Constitution that would allow that, and that's strictly a state matter. So they tossed it out. So now state government powers are <coughs> in, the, uh, uh, in the U.S. Constitution. Any power not delegated to the U.S. Constitution, in other words, anything that isn't in the U.S. Constitution, and then, but people limit. So state governments, if, if you didn't do much, could basically do anything they want, but people limit them by what's in the state constitution. They limit their powers, limit their authority, uh, define how they operate. So the 10th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution summarizes this relationship. This is a highly misunderstood Amendment, but basically it's a summary of all this. So powers not delegated to the United States through the U.S. Constitution or prohibited to the states by the U.S. Constitution are reserved to the states or to the people. So that's why it's important for uh, citizens to look carefully at what our, what our state government does. And if it's not either in the U.S. Constitution or the state constitution, basically it's a power of people. 
So the U.S. Constitution has a number of provisions what the states cannot do. They cannot regulate commerce with foreign nations, uh, like treaties or tariffs. So Washington State can't say, well, we're no longer going to trade with country X. That's not something we can do. But it is within the state government power to engage in and encourage uh, economic development and trade. Uh, but we can't, we don't have the authority to say, well, we're no longer going to trade with Canada or something like that. Uh, states cannot regulate or tax federal property. So uh, we can't tax, you know, the national forests up here. We can't tax uh, uh, military bases. And uh, we can't, and this includes tribal, so we can't tax tribal either. The states cannot create new states. Only Congress can set that process in motion. So there was a, an initiative in California somewhat recently. You, know, you want to divide it into three states. Well, that was what you'd call a plebiscite, just kind of an opinion thing. <laughs> they had no authority. Um, let's see, states cannot coin money. States cannot create armies or navies. They cannot enter into compacts with other states. So for example, the Columbia River Gorge Compact is approved by Congress, not by the states. I mean, Congress wouldn't pass it unless sure both states agreed with it. Um, what is there a provision in there about secession? Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if hypothetically Washington, Oregon, and California wanted to secede, <laughs> so in Canada. Okay, uh, there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution about it, but I've read uh, some Civil War documents. And so there were a number of southern states that seceded. And President Lincoln said, there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that allows secession. Therefore, you can't. Yeah. Therefore, the war. So that is not a power delegated to anybody. So that was President Lincoln's interpretation. So, so can I ask a question? Sure. So as I recall, when the Little Creek Casino, which is in Mason County, first kind of started to grow and open up, there was a, some kind of dispute with the state about gas taxes and who's going to pay them and if they're going to pay state gas. Can you explain that a little bit? I, I can't explain the whole thing, but, but there are some, I think some federal rules or U.S. Supreme Court decisions about gas taxes. And basically the general legal rule is tribes uh, can can only make tax exempt their own tribal members, and they're supposed to tax non-tribal members. But that is not always enforced. So there continues to be huge disputes over this. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, the, yeah, the U.S. Constitution says states cannot uh, enact, you know, after the fact laws or laws that impair contracts. and cannot enact poll taxes. I don't I don't know what that meant for the South some years ago. <laughs> so but then on the other hand, here's some things the US Constitution says states must do. Number one, they have to recognize the US Constitution as the supreme law of the land. That is a requirement in the State Enabling Act and yes our state constitution acknowledges uh, in writing that we recognize the U.S. Constitution as the supreme law of the land. And that applies to the District of Columbia as well, right? Uh, and the White House. I would assume so, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> and they don't have a state government, you know. Right. Yeah, that's an ongoing issue. Uh, the states must comply with the Bill of Rights and all other citizen rights enumerated in the U.S. Constitution and its amendments. So that includes voting rights, uh, freedom of speech, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> this next one, I think, deserves a little investigation. It says states must comply with federal election requirements for election of federal officials. And given some of the challenges in some states during the last election, I'm not sure they complied with that. So I, I hope somebody's looking into it. Karen, I have a question. Yeah. 
the recent Supreme Court decision about culverts and streams. Right. <clears throat> that was a tribal treaty. So you said kind of on the par with our Constitution. There was no line between the tribes and local government. So is local government obliged to comply with the Supreme Court decision? Is there some connection through the state to local government? Uh, the connection is the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. The, the treaties are with the federal government. And so uh, disputes involving tribes go to federal courts generally. And often the big ones go up to the U.S. Supreme mm -hmm. Court. So uh, in, the, in the case of <coughs> culverts, the background is, <coughs> excuse me, never fly with cold. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> Uh, the, you know the famous Bolt decision. Yes. So, so, so the treaties in the state of Washington, most of them, not all of them, uh, preserve the right to fish and I think maybe hunt, but in this case fish in common and uh, with other people. And so there was, for years, there were huge disputes over what percent of the fish that uh, tribes could t take and non-tribal people could take. So finally, after years, it went to federal district court, and Judge Bolt decided that that it would be 50-50. Tribes could get 50% of the catch, non-tribal 50% of the catch. Then, of course, that took a long time to implement. But uh, so then in the meantime, all this development occurs, and some of the streams are not that great a habitat for fish anymore. And <coughs> the tribes are saying, well, if we have a right to fish, uh, we presumably have a right for fish to continue to survive and propagate. And some of these culverts are impeding uh, propagation of fish. Okay. So they took and they, for years, worked on finding a really good case, and they finally found one, and took it to the federal courts. And the courts ruled that the um, parties responsible for culverts uh, have to, you know, have a program to fix them so that fish can survive. And so basically, that's a federal uh, rule, authority, that applies to everybody. So the states and local governments have to do it. Okay. Yeah. So even though there's no direct line between county or city and no, the, the line of authority is federal government to state to local. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And in doing that, the the feds are upholding their uh, kind of treaty responsibility to the tribes for the treaties that were signed in the mid 1800s. Um, let's see, where are we here? Okay, with some implications of all this for the states. You know, there are a lot of federal environmental laws, and you won't find the word environment in the U.S. Constitution, but they're all, these federal environmental laws like air and water are enacted pursuant to the Commerce Clause. Remember, the U.S. government can only do what's delegated to them, and then and words in the U.S. Constitution. So there's a clause in the U.S. Constitution that says you, feds can regulate commerce between states and with the Indian tribes. And so uh, under the Commerce Clause, that's where all the federal environmental laws have their legal authority. So that's water, endangered species, air and water, toxics, and more. And a lot of the laws, though, do provide for partnerships with the states. Uh, now, number two is huge. There are a lot of things that are not in the U.S. Constitution, but there is a clause under responsibilities of Congress, or to, uh, it's called the spending power. They have the right to raise money and spend money. So uh, they can create grant programs. So if there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution, for example, about K-12 education, well, they can create a grant program and say school districts, state, uh, you 
you need to do X, Y, and Z for K-12 education if you want to get this big pot of money. But if you turn down the money, you don't have to do it because it's not, it's not an authority of the federal government, but it's a huge influence through the spending power. And, um, and then another, since the Congress is responsible for regulation of commerce between states, when you're in the legislature, sometimes you want to add labeling requirements to something, but you can't do it if the product is in interstate commerce. So, because that's interstate. So, this, these are some of the challenges of type that you bump up against. Um, let's see, oil, oh, the same thing on cars. People say, well, you know, we ought to require X, Y, or Z on cars and trucks. We can't do it because that's interstate commerce. So, Another one that I spent a lot of time working on is oil spill prevention. Oh, some time ago, the state passed a lot of detailed requirements for uh, tankers, uh, ocean-going tankers, to try to prevent oil spills. Well, the International Tanker Association didn't like it. They took it to federal district court and on up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they finally decided that most of what the state had done really is in the federal jurisdiction and a little bit of it was in the state jurisdiction. So that's an example of how it works. And then, then the last one I have up here is federal water resource policies, meaning related to quantity, have priority over state water rights. So basically, federal water rights have priority over state water rights because we have said, yes, the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. So this is highly misunderstood, has not been adequately uh, implemented and creates vast, um, vast uh, conflicts. I could give you a whole talk on that. <laughs> so, so here's another limitation I've kind of touched on. It. Tribal treaties are a limitation on legislative authority. States can't regulate tribes. We can't zone their property. Other, uh, basically, all kinds of things that we, we can't regulate tribes and tribal lands. Oh, thank you. Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry about my voice. <laughs> <coughs> I'll, uh, I'm coming along. Oh, well, I might not be able to talk. But okay. <laughs> okay. So we can't regulate tribal land. Can't tax tribal land, and then. Yeah, there are a lot of issues with, uh, with gas tax, but basically tribes can't exempt themselves from paying tax, but they're supposed to tax non-tribal members, but frequently they don't and nobody enforces it. So, um, but states need to protect tribal fishing and hunting rights because uh, the federal government enforces treaty rights. And we have to recognize tribal environmental laws for the same reason. And that's a federal state thing. And because uh, the feds protect what the tribes do. And then one kind of odd exception is states have to uh, allow tribal gaming to be the same as non-tribal gaming. And this is, this, I don't know how much time to spend on that. I <laughs> So uh, that, uh, that was kind of an interesting court decision. You can ask me about it if you want. So international treaties are a limitation. As I mentioned, they are legally equivalent to U.S. constitutional provisions. So the U.S.-Canada Treaty on the Columbia River is huge, huge, huge. It governs flood control and electricity generation. Uh, but it is in the process of the U.S. and Canada are considering whether or not either to amend it or to uh, come up with some new agreements filling it out a little better relating to environmental matters. And uh, <coughs> another thing about international treaties, since they have the equivalent authority as the U.S. Constitution, occasionally there are proposed international treaties that would usurp the state's ability to regulate like toxics or something like that, which get into the groundwater. There was a huge potential of that years ago. It was very alarming. So you need to pay attention to what's going on with these international treaties. Oh, and then we have migratory bird treaties that affect Washington. 
that we kind of like. So here's State Enabling Act. As I mentioned, it's, this was enacted in 1889. Uh, so in order for Washington to become a state, we uh, had to do certain things. I think I mentioned these. Recognize the U.S. Constitution, the supreme law of the land. We have to represent a form of government system of schools open to all children which shall be free from sectarian control. And actually our state constitution is stronger on that than on separation of church and state than other, uh, the U.S. one. So our, oh, so here's really important. Our state constitution limits legislative action and requires important procedures. So here on um, the must-dos. So the, leg the Constitution prescribes how long sessions will last and how you have special sessions and how long they last. Second one, only one subject in a bill. And that subject must be expressed in the title of the bill. This is one of the biggest protections for citizens that exists. And Congress does not have this. <laughs> That's why you can have a bill on military spending overseas somewhere and then some member of Congress wants to put in a provision about a mine in their district. So we can't do that here. That would be ruled out of order if somebody raises a question about it. Uh, our state constitution tells how you amend the constitution. It says we have to enact a two-year budget and we have to comply with national and state constitutions. Things you can't do, put two subjects in one bill. I just can't tell you how important that is because people always want to hide things and sneak them on this and that. And they didn't get it here, so they're going to try it there. Um, and then there are a lot of provisions on taxation in the state constitution. You have to follow those. So, can I ask a question? Sure. <coughs> how, how, do we, how does our state constitution compare with other states? Like, are there other states that are much more lenient and they can have two subjects in one bill or sneak around like that? or? You know, I haven't studied that. I don't know if other states have that one subject requirement or not. If they don't, they should. Um, but state constitutions prescribe the form of government. So in some states, they have different sets of elected officials. You know, like Florida, they were electing an agriculture commissioner. Here, we have the governor appoint that person. And so they vary a little bit in terms of the elected officials. We have an elected insurance commissioner. In some states, it's appointed by the governor and so forth. So, uh, but state constitutions tend to be longer than the U.S. Constitution because they have a lot of detail in them. So, the state Supreme Court enforces the state constitution. So, once you get a decision on interpretation of the state constitution out of the state Supreme Court, uh, that's basically it. You can't just willy-nilly take it up to the federal courts. That's not how it works. Because remember that states have a lot of independence. So uh, when the state Supreme Court decided the big K-12 cases, that was it. You can't appeal that to the federal courts. Um, let's see, what have I got? Oh, so here's some of their, I can hardly read this. <laughs> uh, so some things the state Supreme Court does is they basically, the most important thing they do is decide whether a bill or an initiative is unconstitutional. And if the court decides a case on the basis of whether it's constitutional or not, the legislature can't do anything. But if the court decides a case based on, you know, statutory conflict or lack of clarity of the statute or something like that, then the legislature can take it up and pass a bill to fix it. And so on the now famous Hearst case, water, water case, uh, the, the state Supreme Court interpreted the statutes in a way that local governments and state government had not been interpreting the statutes. But since it was a statutory interpretation, the legislature could take it up and therefore we got the bill that's called the Hearst fix. Um, <clears throat> Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> uh, oh, yes. And one thing about the Hearst is that I've asked state Supreme Court justices. So how do you, how do you interpret 
statutes. And they all say, the first thing they do is look at the plain meaning of the words. I, I used to not think that was the case. <laughs> but, uh, but they all say that. And, and in the famous Hearst case, uh, that's exactly what they did. Nobody had really looked at the plain meaning of the words. And the plain meaning was da da da. And so it kind of turned everything upside down and they have to kind of regroup on it. <clears throat> so another limitation on the legislature is just the sheer process. It is so complex, has so many variables. You know, it's a kaleidoscope of variables. There's many complex steps. Bills have to go through multiple committees and processes. Bills have to be voted on by two chambers. They're each <coughs> separate organizations, really. Uh, there are very short deadlines. That's why everybody has lobbyists these days. You can't just easily keep up with it. Um, there are a lot of budget and finance limitations, and that limits what the legislature can do. You know, kind of don't have the money, folks. Um, <coughs> And then legislators from different parts of the state view issues differently. So you can't easily get agreement on big issues because people from one part of the state feel differently than people from another part of the state. So if you're from a timber area, you kind of have one view of the timber industry. If you're from ag, like eastern Washington, you have a certain view of agriculture issues. If you live around Puget Sound, you care about those that are from the high tech industry. Anyway, it. Uh, it's very hard to get agreement on a lot of the big issues because parts of the state are so different. You know, I can get elected in Thurston County, but I couldn't get elected in a lot of other districts. And the same is true for some people from other parts of the state. They couldn't get elected in Thurston County, but they're kind of middle of the pack where they live. So that's how it goes. Um, <clears throat> and then again, legislators' accountability to district voters. Yeah, I mean, people don't realize how much influence they have. Um, often. So I've gone to work on bills just from one citizen input. I think, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I'll work on that. So so the legislature, I don't care for this. This is one of the legislative handouts, how a bill becomes a law. I call it the happy bill. <laughs> it's sort of like a bill is introduced and then happily makes its way through the yeah. yeah. That's not how it works. It's very difficult. This is a better description, all the different decision points in the process. <laughs> and then uh, you need to always remember that uh, legislators are real people and they have personal histories and political histories, community histories, professional histories, and they come from different parts of the state. And so, you know, it's kind of, you got to pay attention to who's who and what they might think. And uh, so legislators' accountability to voters, again, is a big break on legislative actions. I've talked about accountability to voters, but then each, there are four caucuses in the legislature. So the caucus leaders always are looking for ways to expand their caucus to get a bigger majority or if they're in the minority, to get the majority. So they're always assessing issues that way. Uh, and then because legislators often can't agree on issues, uh, that's why a lot of initiatives are filed by citizens. So like, uh, oh, Toxics was one years ago, uh, more recently <coughs> clean energy. And so there are, that's often a source of initiatives. <coughs> well, some of the law enforcement and gun safety ones that were on the ballot this year, uh, those couldn't reach agreement in the legislature. So. so again, as I said at the outset, don't freak <laughs> if, you know, if somebody introduces a bill you don't like, only about 18% pass and often it's less than that. So, and again, for all the reasons I mentioned, and uh, so I've talked about what the legislature can't do. So the, you have like vast protections. You almost have, in some cases, too many. But, uh, but the, what the legislature must do is huge and vast. And so we need to always realize that. They have to enact a biennial budget of about $100 million. That's huge. That's just our state. Pardon? That's just our state. That's just our state, yeah. Yeah, and it covers everything. And our state, well, a second bullet point there, they have to 
fund the K-12 school system, which is one of the biggest expenditure categories. And <coughs> well, if you go to, uh, I think the Senate Ways and Means webpage, they have online an excellent brochure on the state budget. I highly recommend it. And <coughs> so there, K-12, it's so much money and it's so impactful around the state. There's been litigation on that going up the state Supreme Court off and on, you know, like for 40 years or so. Uh, the state has to fund universities and colleges, including this one. Uh, they have to fund natural resources and environmental policy. And the state is the trustee for a lot of the <coughs> lands that we got at statehood. The state is responsible for consumer protection. State legislature has to adopt revenue policies and collection policies. Uh, transportation policy, huge. That is something that's very difficult for people to agree on. That's uh, kind of like a glacial area of policy. That's me. I can say anything I want. <laughs> the state, uh, as I mentioned, local governments are creatures of the state, so the legislature <coughs> has a vast involvement in authorizing the different categories of local government, uh, defining their powers, uh, defining how they will raise money to do what they do. Uh, growth management is kind of a newer subject. Well, it's about 30 years old now, but that's a huge complex thing that legislature is always tinkering with. Healthcare, that's another vast area the legislature gets involved with through funding of Medicaid, State Department of Health, health, health promotion and prevention, but a huge, huge, huge budget for healthcare for low income. Uh, does criminal, does okay. that include state facilities like the, the mental Yes, that includes health. mental health, you know, like, and which has been, you know, very highly publicized how underfunded it is. Yeah. So years ago, when I was way back when a legislative intern 50 years ago, the legislature passed a big bill, we're going to have community mental health centers all around the state. It was a big priority for Governor Evans. And did it happen? No, funding, funding, funding. There's a huge, 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 huge pressure against raising revenue. Even though some people say, well, the legislature taxes and spends. Well, they spend, but they don't tax. And the needs keep going up, so everything is shorted financially. Uh, criminal and civil justice, legislature defines what the crimes are, what the punishment grid is, how the prison system works, funding prisons, rehabilitation and so forth. Public lands management, that's a huge area for public policy. The state owns you know, vast tracts of timberland and farmland and so forth. And actually, the state DNR, Department of Natural Resources, is responsible for, the, you might say, the land underneath Puget Sound and all the, almost all the lakes and rivers. So it's a huge responsibility the state has. And so that includes shoreline management and so forth. Uh, state <coughs> legislature comes up with regulations for financial institutions, try to be sure they operate fairly for people. And then of course public employee policies, pay and retirement and leave and all of that. So there's a lot that the legislature does and it has to do it in an incredibly short time. And so the, the needs of the state and the complexity of the state has grown but the length of the sessions hasn't really and so that's you know, so as soon as the gavel comes down at the beginning of the session, it's just a total scramble. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask about. Um, do you know how we compare with other states and time that the legislature <coughs> is expected to meet? Yeah, it, the time that the legislatures are in session varies a lot. There are some states that the legislature only meets once every other year yes. like we used to. I think Texas, Texas might even be one, which Texas kind of blows right. me away. Nin 90 days every two years. Texas is 90 days every two years. Who does? Texas is 90 days every oh. two years. So they go home on the 90th day. And, and they well, don't come back. Well, I, it, am I correct that that's the legislators have to, they're limited in this meeting time for which they get paid, but what about their staffs and the commissions and all of these? I'm thinking funded, not volunteer Okay, in terms of legislative staff, that varies a lot by state too. And uh, 
Washington is actually kind of a, mo I think in many ways, a model state for how to do this. Uh, we, the legislature has excellent full-time year-round staff to do research and provide information resources all year. I call them a brain trust. They're, and most of the ones that work for the committees are nonpartisan, and that is good. See, in some states, they don't have nonpartisan staff. And then in some states, they don't have year-round staff, some of the smaller states, or they just have, you know, a sprinkling of year-round staff. So they're always bringing on temporary people for the session who aren't the brain trust that we have the benefit from. And so it just varies and varies. Now, California being so big, their legislature is virtually full-time year-round, but uh, New York might be too, but uh, we're kind of an in-between state, and but the smaller the state, the less likely they are to have as much year-round staff. And in some states, uh, legislators don't get paid outside the session. See, here legislators get a, a basic salary year-round, and so then they, they can afford to uh, uh, meet with constituents, go on tours, and work on issues between sessions, but in some states, uh, they don't even get per diem, or they only get per diem for the day they go to a meeting. And uh, I talked to somebody, a legislator from Alabama once, uh, that she had no staff and her husband served as her staff. Well, see, that's, I mean, that's really great, but it's also very difficult when you have as busy a schedule and you need to be with people, et cetera. So, so it varies a lot. Yeah. So, let's see, where am I? Oh, to look up information, I made a copy of this over there. Excellent information sources if you want to follow the legislative process. Washington has one of the best legislative web pages in the country. And you can go look up a bill, you can see the whole history of it. And in fact, in recent years, they've connected Television Washington, TVW, to it. So when you see the on such and such a date, a committee had a hearing, then you can click and watch the hearing. It's simply amazing. And then there's a legislative hotline, legislative information center. They're just like great librarians, just want to get the word out. And uh, <coughs> TVW, if uh, in Olympia, it's on channel 23. I don't know what it is here. But they also, you can go online and you can look up archives of legislative hearings, floor action on any bill that they've ever filmed or recorded by just audio. So all this is available to you. And then don't forget the Public Disclosure Commission. I, I was interested in one of your questions earlier. Did you look up the financing of campaigns? Well, the way you do it is you go to the Public Disclosure Commission website and look up whoever you want to look up or whatever initiative you want to look up and you can see who contributed and then you can see how they spent the money they received. So that's a really important piece of, uh, of accountability and public information. So, and then uh, the Legislative Information Center, I have brochures over there. They are the greatest and uh, you can call them and or go in and visit them and they, they are always very helpful. And I don't know whether they're still doing it. When I moved here, I went over and the fellow in that center spent probably two and a half hours with me going through a tutorial they had on how the legislature worked <coughs> and how Washington government was put together. It was wonderful. Good, and they have classes in, in how to use the legislative mm -hmm. webpage. They're only an hour and so, uh, you know, you might look into that, and I think if you get a group, they might even do it uh, online or, you know, the telephone or something. So, let's see, what else do I have here? Well, thank you for your interest. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or did I give you too much? Yeah. I'm curious about your comment that states cannot regulate products that are in interstate commerce. <coughs> so how does California get away with regulating automobile emissions? Yeah, there is a special federal law that authorizes that. Yeah, and then, uh, and then they modified that federal law 
to say other states could adopt the California standards if they wished. So Washington and Oregon did that, you know, after a tumultuous campaign effort, to say the least. Uh, and, but what I'm kind of alarmed about is the Trump administration is looking at trying to repeal that. And uh, that's just, would be horrible. All it does is put more toxics in the air and affect the climate more. And uh, I, just, I just hope they're getting enough input that uh, they won't do it. And it sounded like to me that because California, and presumably the rest of the West Coast, is so significant in the market that the federal guidelines are likely to pay attention. So it, does, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for the feds to have a lower emissions rate uh, and expect the auto industry to have two different standards of cars. And so the auto industry tends to pay a lot of attention to what the California regulation is, even when it's not national. Yeah, and so it would be terrible to do away with that. Yes. Yeah, it would be terrible. On, on slide number 11, you stated that international treaties are interpreted. Is that because of like language differences, or is it because of, is that like part of the negotiation thing? Well, international treaties basically have the same status once they're ratified as the U.S. Cons a provision of the U.S. Constitution, so you have to live with it. Yeah, you have to comply with it. That's why you need to really care if, if there's an international treaty that might usurp the state's ability to, say, regulate toxics. Yeah. Um, so on slide 29, could you just kind of go up to 29, let's see. Is this a I can't hear you. On slide 29, so my question is. Is that it? Yes, yeah, that one. So all of those realms of power that the legislature supposedly has authority in. If the federal government, let's say, puts out a rule about Medicaid, and they pass through dollars to, to the states, right, to manage the Medicaid program, is that correct? But suppose um, a rule comes down that says, you know, you, you cannot vaccinate people who aren't citizens or something like that. How does the state come up with the money to do that? Can they, is it legal? What, what, what is, how does the state handle that? Uh, I, I, if, did you hear the question? Mm -hmm. So I, I think the way that would work if they came down with a, like a Medicaid policy that most Washingtonians disagreed with, the state could fund it on its own, but it just couldn't use the federal dollars. So they'd have to find the money somewhere else. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, just, just another point. Medicaid is a federal state match program anyway. So, you know, federal money has certain requirements that go with it, the state can adopt that as well as some other stuff or just not. But if they match else. it, they can't even use the matching funds probably for something the feds say you can't do this anymore. That's yeah, right. That's true. So then but they can come up with extra dollars somewhere. Mm -hmm. And they have done that. that I know. I'm yeah. just mm -hmm. curious how that works because if you look at every one of those subjects, look at them all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Scholarships for colleges. Mm -hmm. yeah, everything. Like even the, I think we were the last state to implement the super duper licenses or something. You know, oh the, yes. Yeah, the height, whatever those were. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The hologram licenses. That I yeah. So this makes the budgeting process in state government very complex. You always have to figure out like which pot of money is it, and so is it federal money? Well, what are the federal requirements, uh, and then. Within state government, different pots of money have their own restrictions. So for example, kind of a real big one, is the gas tax. Our state constitution says that they can only be used for highways, roads, and bridges, public highways, roads, and bridges, and like state patrol or something. Cannot be used for transit to get cars off the highways, you know. So they always have to come up with a different pot of money to fund transit. It's very hard. Mm -hmm. So the gun regulation bill that just passed, I heard on the news that the Ferry County Sheriff is not going to enforce that new regulation on guns. Is the state going to step in or how, well, what's going to happen? Well, the that? status of that is the voters passed it 
So it's a statute. Okay. And counties are creations of the state, so they need to enforce it. And if they don't, somebody can bring an action in state court to mandate enforcement and okay. we'd see what would happen. <laughs> but on the other hand, I heard there's an NRA. There, there's an organization that's going to challenge the whole initiative. So yeah, they, yeah. The NRA there, there's lots to watch and learn about process with this right. one. Yeah. So when something's challenged like that, in the meanwhile, is it suspended or is it is it enforced? Is it enforced? Uh, it's it's up to the court. So sometimes, you know, if a statute or a new initiative is challenged, the party challenging it will ask the court, or maybe the defendant oh. would say, you know, please keep it in action or please put it on hold and. Basically, I think that would normally be a decision of the court. Question over here. Um, this is kind of a small budget item, but when, when the state says that a county has to put in, say, uh, voter boxes here and there and here and there, and they're mandated to do it, then they're unfunded. So how, how common is that? Is that how, how can they get away with that? I mean, where does that stop? Well, that's an ongoing, uh, how much the state can require local governments to do, how much money they give them, how much money they don't give them is a continuing tension. So on the voter drop boxes, I think some legislators said, well, you're supposed to do that anyway, so we're not going to give you extra money. Um, and this has been a huge issue on growth management. You know, it's very complex to work on this, and people say, well, you ought to give us more money. And so this, is, on many, many, many issues, this is, this is a tension. But they still have to do it. It's a mandate. It is, <laughs> yeah. It is, and, uh, or take a risk, somebody would sue, and, or try to go to the legislature and get them modified, yeah. You're never done with all this. <laughs> As long as we were talking about voting, um, I'm interested in the process of redistricting and across the country what's going on. Um, and the league, I don't, don't know if you're aware, but the league over the last two years has been studying Washington State's process and looking at models around the country. And they made some recommendations. They came up with a, a really good study recommendations to move more from a bipartisan process to a nonpartisan process like California has. I think they have the model for the country. Um, also to have more public input improving that part of the process. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well I guess first of all having legislatures yeah do the redistricting and having whoever is in the majority be able to very carefully protect all their members, try to carve up the votes to get more members is not good. Uh, and it thwart, I think it thwarts the will of the public too much. So that's what Washington used to have. And of course it dominates everything before you do anything else. Uh, so then I think it was the League of Women Voters who might have brought the proposal that became uh, an amendment to our state constitution they did in the 80s something like that where it is a bipartisan process and so what they do it's uh, five people one person selected by each caucus can't be a member or somebody who's going to run but it's just somebody who's you know very involved in their party politics and very smart and uh, and then there's a non-voting chair so that's kind of worked out, and they negotiate, 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 and then kind of what you get at the end is the majority of districts favor this party or that party, and about a half a dozen are swing. So that's kind of what goes on in this state. Now, if you had a completely nonpartisan process, which I think we might have once, I can't remember, where it went to the state Supreme Court and they appointed a geographer at the University of Washington to draw the line. So he and some graduate students did it. 
And they didn't pay any attention to who was from where. They just kind of carved up the state and all these districts. And <laughs> so the, I think the legislators were quite alarmed at that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's kind of interesting to do it kind of at random. And it's an idea. So. I don't know. But it's, a, I don't know what the league came up with, but it's probably, I'm looking forward to reading it. And, and they, it's a great study. I can give you the link. Okay. Um, but uh, they're going to come up with their own map, it sounds like, this committee. Wh which committee? League, the league. Oh. The state league. Mm -hmm. and they in, in, in the state of Washington? People, their own map based on the census data. Mm -hmm. So it all goes back to that census yes. again. Right. Right. It's so important. Well, all maps are based on the census. It's just how do you, see nowadays, the, uh, the computer data on which block votes how is so good. They can really tailor everything, like carving up a Thanksgiving turkey or something, you know. So, uh, so if you're gonna have a completely nonpartisan, everything's based on census and but there's different ways to draw the lines. And who draws them has different priorities. Or maybe you could find people who have no priorities, you know? I like really, the judge. I really like the idea of having a geographer because I can imagine in some places you could have a district that people couldn't even get across if it were mountainous or, you know. Oh yeah. Well there are there actually there are a lot of criteria in the state constitution and implementing statutes. You're supposed to try to keep communities of interest. You try to avoid, you know, you know, you can't get from one part of the district to another. Uh, there are some recent court decisions where you're supposed to take into account, you know, ethnic communities. Uh, you're not. You're supposed to try not to put a local government jurisdiction like a city in two different districts if you can. Sometimes it's impossible. Counties, of course, get into multiple districts, but you try to keep the cities from being divided into two legislative districts. So there, there are a bunch of criteria. You said there are four caucuses. What are the other two? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, there's Jim Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> caucuses with Republicans. Yeah. Yeah. So. A caucus is basically uh, a group of legislators who communicate and work together on common interests. So the most prominent caucuses in the legislature are the House Democratic Caucus, the House Republican Caucus, Senate Republican Caucus, Senate Democratic Caucus. And they meet Basically, during the session, every day you're on the floor, and they go over, uh, they go over, you know, what's going to be, you know, on tap for the day, and it's they're mostly informational exchange. But there are a lot of other caucuses. There's a coastal caucus. There's uh, I'm active in kind of a history caucus. There are all kinds of kind of subject matter caucuses where people kind of come together and try to keep up with what bills and budgeted items are introduced and, uh, and, and strategize on you know, how to move them or kill them through the process. But the main caucuses, the part of the basic legislative organization are the four caucuses, you know, Democrat and Republican in each chamber. And they each have a small staff to help them. So this last year, um, Shelton, uh, the voters, <coughs> voted in a council form of city government. Mm. We had the three commissioners. Now we have seven people mm. on that board. And there's seven voices. That means better representation as far as I'm concerned. But um, we only have, we have the three commissioners in the county. And uh, we were looking at the possibility of home rule charter. Mm -hmm. uh, just because we thought it would be more representative, there would be more effective government maybe uh, for citizens, more people to go to, say a five member council. Do you think that's a possibility? And uh, Well, there's a lot to think about if you're gonna go to try to get a county charter. I have, years ago, I participated in two in Thurston County. I've done 
not going to do it again. <laughs> uh, one was to restructure Thurston County government. The other was to do a combined county city government. And uh, so what you'd have to do first is elect freeholders. You put on the ballot, uh, you want to pursue a charter, yes or no? And then I think there's something like 16 freeholders or something like that. So you have all these positions to choose from. You elect the freeholders, then they go to work. And I know in Thurston County, they took about a year, but in some respects, I think it really takes longer than that. And then you don't know how, how the campaigns are gonna go at the last minute, who's gonna be afraid of the new government or feel like it, it won't serve their interests. So you have all this campaigning that goes on. So at this point, my recommendation, if you wanna look at that, is, is that the freeholders initially would propose only a method to um, amend the charter. Then you get the charter and you have an amendment process. Then you can consider things one at a time. If you have too many changes up there, people get nervous. So they didn't do that way in the city, did they? They didn't no, get all was different. So why, why not do something like that in the county? Would it be simpler? Just get well, the city can change form of government without a charter, I believe. The they can just uh, put it out to the citizens to vote on. Couldn't, I think. The, couldn't the county commissioners do what the city commissioners did, which was, in, in, in their refusal to uh, do it themselves, um, there was an initiative or right. a petition That's initiative. Right. And um, those people voted to put that, uh, that form up. Um, and all the all the form change meant was that you would have seven people instead of three. You take this. There was a process of the changeover, but ultimately, so the big question was, "What's going to cost us more money?" Not necessarily. You have to figure. That's part of what you have to figure out and put up for a vote. And you don't have to do that. You could you could simply pay the commissioner less. Mm -hmm. um, imagine, and um, that was. That was proposed back when I was doing um, uh, County Commission Watch here, and it came up for discussion, although briefly, because the commissioners didn't want to talk about it. Um, but with the city, um, which included a past, at least one past commissioner from Olson, I don't remember if there were more, um, but the, 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 um, the motivating force was a group of citizens, which included some previously elected people, who gave the, the uh, city guidance about how to change. And of course, they had legal guidance. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's I want to say that's all it took. I mean, that was it's not a simple process. Yes. But they didn't have to change a form of government. It happened very quickly. Yeah, it did. It was just in one yeah. election cycle. Yeah, but it was all the homework. I mean, I was yeah. partly involved in that. That went on for a long time. So yeah. yeah, it's a lot easier to change city government structure than county. But I think the county has to go through a charter. And I can't remember if the state ever came up with some model charters to choose from. Mm -hmm. That was at least talked about for a while, but even getting that through is hard. Mm -hmm. And so basically, the count, changing county government, you need a charter. Go through that big complex process. Changing city government statute says you can do it through process you described. So what happened in Thurston County? Well, they both failed. Nothing. We, and have, we have three county commissioners just like Yeah, time. the one to restructure county government, uh, the proposal that came out of the freeholders was to have a county executive and like five county council members. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so a lot of people thought that would be good. But then, people started saying, well, I'm going to run for county executive. And they became controversial. And that killed it. Uh -huh. They were worried about who would be county executive and have all that power. Couldn't they do that after they change it? And, get the and once you've changed it, you've changed it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but then after it's changed, then get the controversial guy going. Well, but these people jumped the gun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think they use good judgment. 
but a couple of them, especially one of them, uh, freaked people out. And they said, oh, oh, that could happen. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So if we wanted to do something that, like that in Mason County, we would have to talk to the Thurston people to see what went wrong. Well, this was long ago. I'm one of the few that well, remembers. Actually, it was Clark County that just went through in uh, oh, yeah. 2015, Clark County. Yeah. Really? Yes. Yes, they have that. the five council members. Yeah. See, you don't have to do executive council. Right. You can have five co-equals. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think in Clark, they might have defined you run for chair. You don't have the, your colleagues elect you, I think. So there's all kinds of options. Yeah. So you'd have to study them and talk about them and see what you think. So, well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>